Welcome back to HPE Discover 2024. From Las Vegas, we're live. My name is Dave Vellante. Zias Caravalla is here. He's the principal at ZK Research, member of the Cube Collective, friend of the Cube, many time guest, contributed to siliconangle.com. Good to see you, my friend. How are you doing? Great. How'd you hit it today? Week. You were golfing this yeah, morning yeah. with some CIOs. Yeah, yeah, shot 75. Couldn't be happier about that. CIOs played well as well. So as, uh, when the CIOs leave happy, I'm happy. Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> Get so, a little mini CIO summit. Well, thanks for making some time to come back inside uh, this hall. Uh, we're winding up, as you, you know, the, the day three, I guess for us, day four of the conference. To start, what were your big takeaways? Uh, well, obviously AI is the big takeaway here, uh, and HPE you know, uh, jumped on that like everyone else has. I'm a, I'm a little concerned though that you know, NVIDIA today is the uh, you know, cool kid in high school, and everybody wants to be their friend. And I'm finding that across all the shows that you and I have even been to this year, everyone's got this NVIDIA relationship, and they all kind of look the same. And, um, and that's a concern for the industry, because with the lack of differentiation, then everybody winds up just being a channel for NVIDIA. And uh, I asked several HPE people, including Antonio in our analyst Q&A, and he focused a lot on the services and support and sales, and while I think that's notable, I do think HPE could have focused, he could have focused his answer more on some of the technology, like OpsRamp and uh, the, the networking that HPE has, especially with Juniper coming. And so, it'd be good to see them be able to differentiate themselves from a technology perspective more so than service and sales. So. Well, so a couple of differentiators that I'd point out and, and then to get your reaction on. John Furrier uh, has been tracking how long and, uh, uh, Jensen has stayed on stage for each of these events. Uh, HPE was the longest, notwithstanding GTC, like 25 minutes. Yeah. Mostly he's 10 to 15 minutes. Was so it because we're in the sphere and he wanted to hang out there more? It, I think so. Yeah. I, mean, I think probably the first keynote ever in the sphere uh, Antonio evidently mentioned that at H the HPE studio, but of course he didn't attribute Silicon Angle and John Furrier, so we'll, we'll just make that on the record here. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we'd like attribution going forward. And, uh, so that's funny, tongue in cheek. Okay, uh, the other piece of it is that the messaging that this is not a reference architecture, that this is a complete system. Yes. And, and you know, we'll see how much of a difference that makes. It should make a difference if, it's, if in fact the competitors are only doing reference architectures and not full systems, uh, that's going to be a differentiator. You know, having said that, Jensen's always emphasizing that we're a systems company, we build systems, and then we break them apart, and then we allow you to you know, put them together. When you do put them back together, we've done all this systems work. So, what are your thoughts on that? How much of a differentiator do you think it will be for HPE? Yeah, if it really is as simple as they say, three clicks and you're up and running, yep. then I think that is a differentiator. I don't, I don't know if any of the other OEMs have a three click roll it up and, and turn it on system. So um, certainly not Dell, uh, Cisco's still building theirs. Uh, so I, I do think that here when you think about what the long term differentiation of this industry could be, it will wind up being um, ease of use, I think, in a lot of cases. And I think for a lot of enterprises, building your own AI stack certainly isn't going to be easy. Uh, you know, the things are more complicated. Um, uh, the, the, you know, the, the risk reward here is pretty high for enterprises too, which makes ease of use more important because everybody wants AI. Most companies I talked to aren't really sure how to deploy it. They all tell me complexity is a lot higher than it was even two years ago. And so, if there's a way to minimize the complexity by getting a turnkey system, it reminds me a lot of the early days of, of private cloud when VMware, Cisco, and EMC had the VCE stack. Right. That was incredibly popular because it was an engineered system. And then eventually we got good at best practices and we didn't need them anymore. And so, you know, when you look at HPE's AI stack with NVIDIA, um, I think we can almost look at it as the the, the AI equivalent to what VCE was to private cloud. So the, the trade-off is granularity, because they did the t-shirt sizes, the small, medium, large, and extra large. And based on what you're saying, I think that's a good trade-off. I, I, would, I would rather lean towards simplicity, like Snowflake and database, than have like infinite granularity and knobs to turn. I mean, I, I think the, that the former is going to play better, at least initially in this AI land grab. Oh yeah, hundred uh, percent. I agree with you on that. If if my choice as a CIO is take my fully integrated box, three clicks, turn it up, maybe I give up some optionality or 
go spend months, maybe years, tweaking and tuning, turning knobs and levers, I mean, that's a no-brainer, especially now. Time to market's so important here. And this is where the converged infrastructure, you know, bring it up an interesting point about converged infrastructure. David Flynn, who was the CEO of Fusion IO and, and, and at the time, said something that I thought was pretty prescient at the time, now it's pretty obvious, is that the hyperscalers, you know, they'll spend engineering time they throw engineers at it to, oh, save, yeah. to save money. Enterprises will spend money to save time because they don't have the resources. And it's true, if they can find a, 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 what is, a you know, few three-click solution and it, and it maybe you know, costs more, or maybe it doesn't even cost more, they'll go for that every time. Yeah, well, why do you think White Box never really took off an enterprise? Yeah. Right? I remember talking to one of the telecoms even about uh, they, they actually looked at white box, writing the code, supporting it themselves, and they said the TCO was 5X than what it was to buy just a Cisco switch. Now that's just one switch, right? So you think about doing that with a full AI stack. I, I think, you know, today, Dave, as early as we are, with as few best practices as we are, and as immature it is in the channel, I don't really understand how it would make sense to try and build it yourself. Unless you really feel like you have the engineering chops to differentiate, but then your, I mean, your, your IT costs are out of control at that time, but that, that's going to be okay for some companies, but it's a very small percent of companies. Now, I have never attended uh, an Atmosphere event. I thought it was really smart that they put the two events together this year. Uh, there were about 15,000 people here. Which yeah, is, which and about is, a third were atmosphere, I was told. So that okay. was a pretty impressive so, number. So smart move. I actually think it's about time that they, they made that move. Yeah. But it was a, it was a very well attended event. It's, you know, it's quieting down here yeah. on, on the getaway day, but, but day one and day two were packed. What was atmosphere like? What were the key messages? Any discussion on the Juniper acquisition and how that all fits in? Yeah, well, certainly the Airheads uh, audience uh, audience is very pot, you know very big. Uh, they're very passionate about the HP products. Uh, in fact, I thought it was funny during Antonio's keynote when he mentioned Airheads, yeah, and yeah. then he was almost defensive about it, saying, no, no, they like to be called yeah. that, just to make sure that the rest of the HPE audience knew that that, that was the, uh, uh, the, the group's he name. He wasn't a pejorative, it was yeah. like, like Alpha Geek, that's, yeah, a, yeah. that's a compliment. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, that, uh, they, they really couldn't say a lot about Juniper. I think the key message to HPE customers is, look, we're not, there's no concern about buying Aruba products today, and Phil Montra was very, very clear about this. Whenever we make a product decision, we give our customers years of notice. And I've talked to some customers that are a little concerned if I continue to invest in Central, it looks like Mist is coming in and that might wind up being you know, the roadmap for the future. And Phil wanted to make sure everybody knew, if that's the case, it's going to be years from now when that happens. And in fact, I think over time what you'll see is you'll have Mist and Central, they'll eventually converge years out, and you'll everyone will wind up in the same place. You just won't know that it's happening because they're taking different roadmaps. And that's the right strategy. I mean, oh, right very clearly. It's yeah. like, give give customers plenty of time. It costs the vendor more to do that. Yes, but they got to do the engineering is what's the right. point I was going to make. But it's better for the customer. And so I think in that case, um, it, it was a good message for the Aruba audience to calm them down and let them know you can continue investing in us, and you're not, you're not going to be put at risk. And that's, that seemed to make a lot of them happy. And so, uh, and I do think they like the integration of the rest of HPE. I think it's been a long time coming for that. And um, you know, the whole edge to cloud story um, you know, does involve more than just networking. But I would like to see a statement of direction bringing MIST and uh, Central together um, and, 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 and have that engineering work start, because as we know, if you get you know, multiple single panes of glass, it causes other problems yes. for customers. I think as the, uh, and I think they will do that once the deal closes. The rub's going to come, Dave, from a, from a sales perspective. If I'm an HPE salesperson and it's Greenfield, do I sell Mist or do I sell Aruba? In, in a lot of cases, I think it's going to come down to, if I'm a legacy Juniper salesperson, I'm going to have an affinity to Mist, and if I'm a legacy Aruba salesperson, I'm going to have an affinity to that product. But that, to me, is, I think, where a lot of the work would need to be done to educate the sales force where you sell what and why. What's uh, the right strategic yeah. fit, yeah. And I do think there's some obvious ones, like uh, HP is very big in gaming and hospitality, right? They're part of hotels, they're part of the Golden State Warriors, Tottenham Hotspur, a lot of, the, where Juniper doesn't really have much of a stadium footprint. Juniper is very big in a lot of um, uh, universities, 
And so you can see that there's some natural synergies between the two, but there's obviously going to be a lot of overlap as well. Okay, so we've been like, perpetually on the road for the last six <laughs> months, it feels, right? Yeah. This is like, the, this is the last day. I see day. more of you than my wife. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, don't worry, I'm going to be, we're going to be home for a while. Yeah. Um, but so, you know, you're thinking about, I think this is the, the, the last day of the spring, right? I mean, this is the first day of summer, last oh, day yeah. of spring, it's getting close Happy here. Happy summer. summer. Summer solstice yeah. today, right? Yeah. Okay. So wow, looking back six months, I mean, I don't even want to go back a year. We, we, sometimes we go back to November 22 when ChatGPT was announced, forget that. You know, so much has happened since then. But if you go back from the beginning of this year to where we are now, how would you describe the AI sort of progression and where do you think we're going from here over the next six months? I, I think customers now, um, I don't want to, if you use the Gartner profit disillusionment, I don't think we're quite there, but I do think Customers have now kicked the tires enough, <clears throat> and they, they're still not sure what to do with it is the problem. And I'm a little worried that we're going to have a situation of, um, you know, earlier this year, or last year, Cisco had claimed digestion issues, customers overbought. Yep. And I do wonder if we're going to see that here, where customers were so thirsty, and they're getting, every CIO tells me their bosses are screaming, we need the AI strategy, so they're investing in the technology. But are we going to wind up in a situation where, with, without a lack of, a roadmap of what to do with AI, you bring the technology and you spend the money, and then it looks like a bit of a failure because you didn't know how to implement it um, properly, or at least what problems it is you're trying to solve, right? And I think there's a, there's a real risk that could happen, and so for the OEMs and the, and the vendors, it's very important that they help their customers understand what, what the right use cases are and what the right use cases aren't, because uh, you don't want customers investing all this money. I mean, this is not cheap stuff. And um, you know, the CTOs are now telling me for the first time in a decade, they're buying more data center space, yep. right? And uh, so you've got a lot of conflicting forces. I'm trying to save money, I'm trying to be more sustainable, but I'm buying more AI and I'm buying more data center space and something's got to give. And I'm, um, and I'm concerned we're going to see that in the back half of the year. And the data center builders are saying, oh, I, I don't have enough power. Yeah. Right? And that's a, that is a, a real legit problem and I got I to gotta figure it out and bring it in. Uh, Charlie Cowis at the financial analyst meeting earlier this year, Broadcom, I thought laid out very succinctly, he said, look, the ROI in consumer for AI, it's a no-brainer. I mean, they're trying to build, we know they're working toward building, you know, million GPU clusters. They're nowhere, nowhere close to that today, but the bigger the GPU cluster they can build, the more ads they're going to sell. The better targeting they're going to have, yep. they're going to compress the time to value. No and brain. they can measure the value very easily. Yes, yeah. no, and it's a no-brainer. And, and these, these hyperscalers, the internet giants, they're awash with cash. It's on their balance sheet. They might as well invest. It's a, it's a huge arms race. Okay, and that's what's been powering all this momentum. NVIDIA earlier was up today again. Um, but I think to answer the, the, the point that you just brought up, the question becomes, is, is Jensen's law, does that hold true, i.e., if you buy more, the more you buy, the more you, you save. The more you buy, the more you save. If that's true, then this thing has some more legs. Uh, certainly will be the case with the big guys doing training who have a lot of cash. Whether or not that trickles into the enterprise, I, I, I think it's clear, it has not trickled into the enterprise you know, quite yet. It was interesting, we just had Deloitte on and I sort of was laying out that scenario. He said, look at, we actually see it differently. Our, we have big customers coming to us in things like financial services and they're going hard after this. I don't think most customers are doing that. Most customers are experimenting, hitting singles, doing chatty-like applications, being careful about where they allocate the budget, stealing from other budgets. Um, now, whether or not that shifts, or changes in the second half remains to be seen. I, th I think the summer, probably not. Maybe Q4, we start seeing some of those bigger NPVs. And if we don't, I think to your point, things are going to get tighter. Yeah, and I think part of this is, like I said, an uncertainty of what to do with it and when to roll it out. I was at a conference earlier this year where I was talking with a bunch of uh, contact center managers about AI in the contact center, which is one of the low-hanging fruit use cases. And one of them was saying, uh, the large language models have been evolving so fast that you think you're, you've finished testing and you're ready to roll it out and boom, a new one rolls in and then you rerun all the models, you know, or you, you put all your data in with the new models and you go through that whole process again. And then he says, I'm never sure when to give it the go because 
it's changing so fast. Yeah. And he said, I'm perpetually in the state of almost ready to go, but I can't ever seem to push it over the finish line. And I, and I hear that over and over and over. And so there's some obvious use cases, like, you know, like it is, I think contact center is a good place for it. I think it's an AI ops tool, but, and I do worry sometimes that IT pros wait for perfection Right, they, oh, it made a couple of errors, it answered 18 of my 20 questions correct. Well, that's still better than people, and as long as your threshold's better than people, I think you're a winner. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I do think there's a lot of trepidation about getting it wrong, and that's where the hesitation comes to deploy. If I put it in, and I, you, you remember like the early days of chatbots and things, that was a disaster for a lot of companies. Yeah. And uh, nobody wants a repeat of that, because you're going to drive customers away if you deploy it wrong, and then, you know, a lot of people are going to be losing their jobs if that happens, right? Yeah, so, and then the legal, yeah. legal and governance and compliance issues. People are people are rightly yeah. concerned. The question that, is: Is no AI better than bad AI? That that's that's not a clear cut answer. Yeah. It's one of those consultant it depends things. And who's um, got a good handle on their data? How many enterprises really have a good handle on their data? Yeah. So we know broadly that the answer's you know few and far between. Yeah. But if you have isolated data sets, then potentially you, you can have a good handle on data, but then the question becomes, well, what's the real value? How, what's the actual size of that benefit that you're getting? You might get an ROI of 200%, so what if it's five bucks? It doesn't matter, yeah. right? And so that's not going to fund future AI investments. So th some of those bigger NPVs have to start hitting in the second half, or I think people will tighten up. You will hit that trough of disillusionment. Yeah. You know? I, I, I don't think we're there yet, I agree. But part of that is because the hyperscalers are putting in so much funding to this thing, and that's like a gift to all of us. We're like, yeah, keep spending. Yeah, yeah. Blackwell's coming, great, spend more on that. HPE, same thing, so. Yeah, I think years, you know, a decade from now, AI is going to be built into everything we do. Yeah. I, I look at it like the early days of the internet where, you know, as an IT pro, I used to go to internet conferences. There are no internet conferences anymore <laughs> because I don't need the value to be proven to me. Right. You know, there are AI conferences today and a decade from now we won't have them anymore. Beginning from here to there, you know, even in the early days of the internet, it was very problematic. What do you use it for? Should you take credit cards? There was a lot of ups and downs. And we're going to go through that here. The long-term benefit is a, it's a no-brainer but how you fund it, where you apply it, how you measure the ROI. I think we're going to see a lot of change in leadership in, um, you know, in the S&P and things like that based on it like we did with, with, the, er, with the internet and cloud. These transitions always create a big upheaval in the business world. Um, and so I, I think long-term trends are positive but expect some bumpiness along the way. Well, and the prevailing <coughs> law determines those winners and losers. It was Moore's law, it was Metcalf's law in the, in the internet phase, and that, I would argue, that really actually powered a lot of the cloud, uh, the, you know, the, the network effects, and, and the so, certainly social media, you know, big data, cloud, you know, social, and, and mobile. You know, that was, you know, Metcalf's law was really the, the prevailing force at the time, and we'll see if Jensen's law holds true, I mean, he's been, he's been right a lot. Yeah, but I think from an HPE perspective, they have such a big footprint with a lot of leading companies, they should be in just a prime position to be able to help uh, take, take a lot of the early adopter customers that are using AI and be able to replicate that across their broad customer base. I mean, they, they, their customer base is literally who's who. Uh, of, uh, of the business world. Well, it's interesting, these infrastructure companies, um, it's almost like Dell and HPE have kind of a duopoly for you know, on-prem, you know, yeah. hybrid. I mean, I, certainly IBM's in there, but they're not really in I think the advantage player. HPE has, and, I, and I'm hoping Antonio meant this when he said it, at the, when they acquired Juniper and they had the Rami Antonio um, analyst Q&A, and he said, We're, we want to be known as a network first company, yeah. right? And I think, um, in fact, uh, Sanjeev Katwa, the CIO of Tottenham Hotspur, uh, I went to the session yesterday that he was in, and he said, the network is the most important asset we have today, mm -hmm. because without it, we can't do anything. We can't process tickets, we can't sell people stuff, we have no 911, we've got, or whatever their version is over there, right? And so, uh, I think there is a pivot going on within corporate IT to be, to be in a world that's more network centric. I think HP being a traditional compute company is in a good position to make that change, more so than even Cisco, because Cisco's, it'll seem somewhat self-serving. Dell doesn't really have any network assets. And they have so, taken a different strategy, yeah. you know, kind of building the networking and, into and, the And I the think servers. I would really, I'm really hoping 
that that message continues to carry through to next year's Discover and across other HP activities. Because I do think it uh, with the Juniper acquisition, they have a um, they, you know they have a. A, just a very, very good portfolio of network products now, and they can actually do end-to-end -end networking today. Right, and that's where this, this duopoly thing is interesting, but it's diverging because, like you say, HPE becoming a networking company yeah. in many respects. It was, Dell is much more storage heavy than, say, HPE is, so they've got some uh, potential advantages there. And then you got the cloud guys, who are still growing, you know, at, 20% a year. Yeah, it's crazy. Which is at, at, at you know collectively 200 billion dollars, and so you know you hear a lot about repatriation, but the numbers, you know, still aren't propelling. Well, you can repatriate guys, and grow. Yeah, right? no, they're, they're absolutely. Not, yeah. They're, they're not mutual. They're both can be true. Yeah. There's, we know anecdotally repatriation is happening. It just pales in comparison to the growth that you're seeing in the cloud. But it's like right now, it's good to be in tech. You know. Yeah. Except you know, SaaS is is showing some cracks in the armor, so we'll see how that plays out. Cause, yeah. Because they haven't really benefited from the AI wave, notwithstanding service now is obviously. Actually, what's awkward. fascinating to me, Dave, is if you look at the capital markets, NVIDIA's created this massive tailwind, which, but it's lifted very few boats. Ar Arista has gotten a big AI bump, Pure Storage has. How many other infrastructure vendors have? Well, Dell has, you know, Dell's cranking this year, Supermicro has, yes, and, 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 yeah. and most recently HPE. HPE's yeah. up about, I want to say 22% in the last 30 days. So HPE's kind of, their momentum's catching up, and I think, I think uh, uh, HPE's being very conservative about their guidance. They, they beat and they raised. They're only, they're guiding to like, I don't know, one to three percent growth. I think they're going to grow fast. I think, they're, I think their AI server backlog is much, much bigger, and I think coming out of this show, they're going to they're they're beat again, but they're smartly, I think, being conservative. So you're seeing a little bit of broadening beyond the NVIDIAs and the Qualcomms and the Broadcoms and the, and the TSMs and to, the, to some of the infrastructure plays, but it, it certainly hasn't hit the software stack yet for the Mongos, you know, Snowflake's kind of bouncing around right now. You know, Databricks is private. I think they're growing actually very fast, I think, for other reasons. Um, you know, Salesforce, got hit a little bit, like I said, yeah. ServiceNow is killing it, yeah. you know, so that is the one we are, sort of we up are the seeing stack anomaly. We have not so. That's, yeah, very yeah, much so. Yeah. So, all right, Zias, hey, awesome to see you. Thanks yeah. so much Always for making some time for yeah. us. All right, keep it right there. We're wrapping up day three of HPE Discover, live from Las Vegas. You're watching theCUBE.